Okay, well, welcome you guys. Um, welcome to uh, another Gamma Education uh, program. Uh, we are here today, my, uh, my computer is having a good time with me. Uh, we're here today uh, working on a seminar that uh, I did not teach. Uh, so you guys are here for creating a culture of well-being in the workplace. Um, there are tons of information that I'm going to throw at you guys. And um, my best suggestion for you guys, I've, I've laid it out as a table of contents. And I would suggest writing down the steps that I have. Um, and if you don't have time for that today, go back and do that later. But I would definitely write down the steps because I've laid the uh, seminar out as a sort of like a worksheet, right? So if you take these steps, then you can help your company create this culture of well-being in the workplace. So I want to give you that little caveat. This is a gamma sponsored seminar. This isn't really um, a seminar that we have done in the retail division. It is... Um, it's a seminar that I went and took some classes and did some research on, and then we're we're bringing it back to you. Um, so like it says on my screen, um, it's created on stuff based on the teachings of WebMD Health Services, Corporate Wellness Magazine, and wellbeingpeople.com. Um, I'm merely your guide, uh, but I did learn a lot while I was doing it. It was really incredible to learn, and I have really summed it up in a really palatable way. One of the things I want to share with you guys about this seminar is that we will talk about one thing and then we're going to go back and we're going to end up talking to about another th about that thing over and over again. You will see it kind of laps over itself and there's a lot of redundancy, but it's actually very important to the process of implementing this culture of well-being in your in your company. Um, so be patient and be understanding about that, okay? Um, so about me, uh, a lot of you know me, I'm Dawn Studebaker, I'm the former GRD chair, it's been nice being able to say that and not have that pressure on me so much, uh, but I enjoyed serving the membership while I did it. Uh, I was a game store owner for eight years, I did recently close my store, but uh, that's okay, I'm a big believer in gaming and I love gaming and I love Gamma and I love helping everybody become better at what they do. Um, before I was in the game industry, I've had 15 years of marketing or management experience. And then I had to kind of hone it in on marketing and social media. I worked in the medical industry. I had a team of 15 um, sales and marketing staff on my team uh, below me. Um, with me, I like to say with me, um, but we created a lot of big projects and that was right prior to opening up my game store. I have a specialization in social media and marketing. So that's a little bit about me, enough about me. So this is your table of contents. This is exactly what I was talking about, how I really want you guys to use this as a template for your worksheet. Um, if you need me to create something later to give you guys, um, that's fine, but I sort of set the seminar up as a worksheet, so you can really balance this as um, a go-to for implementing this in your own company. So what are those table of contents? Well, we have, um, I got to move some of these chats, I apologize, so that I can read them. <laughs> All right, so we have the first thing that we have is a workplace culture. We're gonna talk about what it is. Then we're gonna talk about why it matters. Then the next step is identifying that vision and then considering your people. And then get feedback. We're gonna talk about that. You're gonna hear get feedback a lot in this seminar. Um, it's really important for you uh, to understand when we're talking about it and why we're talking about it in those, in those specific points. Um, Outlining your culture and what it looks like, um, how and what to include in that outline and what that outline is really for, creating the strategy, implementing your ideas, and the final step is going to be, oh, I went past, I went too far past, I'm so sorry, you guys, uh, measuring your success, okay? So are those changes working? How is it doing? Those are the nine steps we're going to go through. If you didn't get a chance to write them all down, they're going to be in each segment as we talk about it. So 
workplace culture. What is it? What, right? Like that's the big thing. There's so much, there's so much out there that defines what workplace culture is. Um, but what does it really mean? There, the discussions that we have around it basically sum it up to, um, it's basically the organization struggled to, to define its personal culture and how that looks like for your company. Um, you want to think about from the beginning to the end of your company, what is your company founded on? And we're going to get into that in depth. Um, but cultures developed after a company basically measures your mission statement, you balance your mission statement with your values and where you want to be. It also is the interaction of how we collaborate, how decisions are made, how people interact with one another. The entire process is super all inclusive. And if you think about it, some of the things that you implement in your day-to-day -day structures can actually be very conducive to a culture of well-being. But what you're going to ask yourself is, is it or is it hindering a culture of well-being? And we're going to kind of talk about it in one of the buzzwords we like to say in our industry is SWOT analysis. So if you're doing a SWOT analysis on your workplace culture, we're going to get to the bottom of it. Um, but Basically, when you think about workplace culture, you want to think about how can you create and nurture this within your organization? And that's what we're going to get to the bottom of. Um, so we already talked about all of this on this slide, how things are created, how people collaborate, and how business decisions are made. And I, one thing I want to point out, which we're going to talk about later, is it's a top-down and then inside out kind of prospectus. You wanna make sure that you're not just thinking about it from the bottom or the inside out, top, bottom, inside out, everybody has to be on board with this. So when I was going through these seminars and I was looking at companies that do things really, really well in the game industry, you'll be proud to know that a game room is one of the biggest things that people offer their companies heavily in the tech industry, which was interesting, but I found this slide and I really wanted to focus on it because if you look at this, this is Bento and they're an online um, producer. They, they do a lot of like um, uh, software development stuff. They are in the IT tech world. But what I loved about it is they know that most of their stuff is it's, it's accounting, basically, I, I believe, if memory serves me right. Um, but they're online. So their idea of workplace culture, if you look at that slide, is starting with the first thing, be human to each other, be human to customers, and be human with our partners. It's so simplistic, but yet so important. And they have this philosophy within their company and their mission statement that they want their software to not feel like just software. They want want it to feel personal. So that was interesting how they then incorporate it into their workplace culture. And we'll we'll talk about this in depth a little bit down the line, but I wanted to start us out on that right foot. So why does it matter? Why does workplace culture matter? That's a big question people have all the time. The biggest thing for me that I have discovered in this, and I mean, I think I knew, but but really seeing it and hearing it was, it's a vital com like uh, competitive advantage for keeping and retaining higher talent. And that's the biggest thing um, that strikes me. I am a person that I was always hiring up. I wanna hire people that um, uh, accentuate my deficits, right? So if you have a great workplace culture, it's helping you to have a competitive advantage to keep them, make them happy, and also get more out of them. The reality is, is that um, if people feel comfortable, they actually work more. Um, and that's sort of a hard thing for people to get their heads around because, um, a lot of people have that mentality that um, you just work, you work hard, blah, blah, blah. And you sort of forget about the fact that if, a, if an employee feels better, they work harder for you and they want, they're invested in your success. If you're constantly beat down or you feel drudged, you just don't work as well. So uh, all of us as company owners or just as management, we really need to think about how does that work within our, our overall corporate synopsis. Um, but you're going to have retention. You're going to have more productive teams when they feel valued. Um, it's basically if they feel valued and heard, they work harder. And we went through a phase in our lives where we were like, pay better and um, 
give spiffs and give bonuses. And uh, according to this, the research, again, this isn't my personal belief. This is based on studies. Uh, the reality is, is sometimes those can feel um, taxing and like a drudge or they expect them. So that's why we're going to talk about like mixing up and, and evaluating that, um, those processes that we're going to outline to define our culture, because what works now might not work in a year. What works in a year may not have worked you know, in five years. So uh, it is important and we wanna make sure that we're always you know, creating that culture and uh, identifying that it is super important to where we're at. Um, one more thing I wanted to talk about back on, I'm gonna go back my screen back a little bit. Oh, I apologize, going ahead. One of the things that I wanna talk about in that workplace culture, why it matters is uh, there was a uh, quote that I found that said, people who are at a higher level of well-being are more social, energetic, charitable, and cooperative. Those are all things we want to be, and those are all things that we want in our employees, and those are all things we want to share. So why does it matter? You're going to get more out of it. That's that's sort of the, the bottom line. All right. So the next step to this is identifying our vision, right? We have to identify our vision. Where do I start? What does that mean? Um, well, what we're going to do is we're going to look at these different areas. And you guys in your company may have them laid out in different ways, but this is just a little infographic to help you identify this. But number one, you want to look inside your mission statement. If you don't have a mission statement, might be a great time to kind of like put one together because it's sort of like the, the ground level of where you're going to go with your company culture. Um, and your, your mission statement does not have to have company culture in it. It just really needs to define where you want to go. A lot of times your company culture will, will be in it, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and if it's old and it isn't in there, you can kind of like pull things out of it, right? So look at your mission statement. Then we're going to look at our employees and we're going to talk about what we do with our employees to get this information in depth later. But there are so many elements when we're identifying what our vision is for our company. Number one, we have to talk to our employees. What makes our employees happy? What makes them tick? Um, you know, asking them what interests them and not just in the company, in life. What motivates and what are they excited in? Are they a Trekkie? Are they a crocheter? Do they love their family? Do they like to travel? Get to know your employees and get to know your team. When we pull this on to a level where it's like um, a huge corporation, you're going to pull that down into subsections. So each team is responsible for doing that. And you're treating each team like a subsection of the company with the overseeing seeing mission statement and then broken down in those subsections. But most of us in the retail, I mean, in the um, game industry, we're usually um, a smaller company. We have some larger companies, but for the most of us, we are um, few, five to 10 employees is a very good average. Um, especially for retail. Some retail stores have 20 employees, but um, get to know them, understand what makes them tick, and not just for the store or not just for the company. Uh, understand outside things. And then what's the purpose of your company? If you're a retail store, your, your purpose is to sell games, encourage um, uh, socialization, uh, education. There are many things. What is your purpose? If you're a board, if you're a publisher, what is your purpose there? Do you have silly games? Do you have collegiate games? What is the overall purpose of your company? And where do you see yourself going? What types of programs and resources um, are you offering the world? And what do you want to offer within? You want all of that stuff listed. Nothing is too small to put in this list to help you kind of sort out where you're going to go with your company culture. And again, we're just trying to make sure that all of our employees, all of our customers, uh, a, a culture of well-being doesn't just stop at employees. It extends to our customers. So we want that to carry down, but our, our staff is going to be the caveat to get it there, right? Um, so make sure you know where you want to be in the future as well, too. And again, here's where the redundancy sort of comes in because the next steps we're going to talk about, consider your people was in identifying um, uh, your, your, your vision, like knowing what your overall vision is. 
So when you're considering your people, we talked a lot about that already in the vision, but I really want to talk about things that we're going to talk about again. Again, like I said, it's overlapping and it's just the nature of the way that this works. But when you're considering your people, I want you guys to talk about like what volunteerism makes them tick. I want you to think about like, what are your spaces like that you work in? What is your environment like? So if your company is all in cubicles, um, you might want to have an area for them to go to like blow off steam where uh, Bento and some of the big Chicago tech companies will add a little like area where they can go play cornhole and they do their creative processes through physical activity. Some people have walking meetings. Some people take their staff to the park after um, hours and they just are in nature. And then that's where they're brainstorming and doing some work. So does your staff need a change of environment? Do they need um, elemental changes? If you're a retail store, I mean, if there's a lot of retail store owners on this call or watching this later, you can relate to, we're just in such a vibe of demoing games, teaching games, selling games, that sometimes our employees just need that old school break room that's a quiet place where they can turn um, uh, a card that has a quiet sign on it. So, you know, when you enter that area, don't come in like a wrecking ball. They're trying to decompress. So consider your people, consider what, um, what their day is like and try to give them things that help improve their day and increase their productivity because that's what this is all about. Happy employees, happy leadership team, happy, happy company, right? Um, you can do small things like if, if uh, BLM is really important to me, maybe this month's charitable contributions are going to go to a program that is, uh, that I'm serious about. Or um, if uh, Trevor Project is really a, a big thing for one of my other staff, then we're going to donate to that. But really sharing through all of those different um, uh, ideals, passions, and um and needs for environment while working is, is why, why considering your staff is important. And do not forget your management. So many times as owners, we can, you know, they're going to, they're going to be the, the catalyst to getting this done, but they also have to be thought about too. So don't forget about your, your management staff. And quite honestly, don't, don't forget about yourself either. You're part of this company. You're the heartbeat of it. You're what makes it drive and what makes it go if you're the owner. So don't forget about yourself either. All right, now let's get feedback. So how, when we're considering our staff, we need to get feedback from them, right? We can't just assume we know them. We have to talk to them. We have to communicate with them. This seems very logical, but there are some things in here that I really want you to think about when you're doing, um, doing this sort of implementation. Some people aren't going to tell us exactly what we need and are scared to be honest about what they want. So there are ways that you can do this by, by getting and collecting feedback in a myriad of ways. Some of the things you can do besides, you could have um, blind surveys where it really truly isn't traceable. Ironically, some people don't even think that that is as blind as they think it is. Um, you also could do open conversations in meetings ahead of time. A lot of times, if one person is a little more gutsy to say what they want, others might be more open to talk about it. So um, if you have a feeling that you're not getting all the feedback, uh, hive mind is also a very good way to get things done. Um, but make sure you're writing down all these, these suggestions. I also suggest that you take a journal and um, keep a journal of suggestions over the years and, and go back to that. Because if you have a more shy um, staff, you may need to go back to some of the other suggestions and suggest suggestions past employees have had to get them uh, kind of feeling um, safe. But beyond feeling safe to share, also not understanding why they are in a drudge or why they don't have a feeling of well-being, because they might not be good at verbalizing or vocalizing it. And that's imp important for us to remember and think about when we're trying to make this really awesome place for everybody to work and be productive and feel proud, right? 
and I'm not going to gloss over like when we're talking about the old school way of of pay um, uh, being like the way that we all thought was well I pay you a lot you should be um, <laughs> you should be a, um, a a good hard worker but pay isn't the be all end all we keep saying that but pay is important we are in a in a i don't want to gloss over that we are in a place in our world where we're talking about um living wages and this idea of just getting people for the cheapest they're they're going to feel that that's going to create a company that isn't vast in in in, in a culture of well-being you need to have competitive wages fair wages um, and not over ask, right? So getting feedback, if the only thing they say is good, strong pay, um, there is more to it. And it's proven that there is more to it than just that. So try to get feedback beyond that. Um, and write down what you're hearing the most. And we're gonna talk about that and identifying and laying it back when you get that information. Um, so again, the redundancy of the seminar, but it, it, it helps embed it in, in strength with, with us. And I want to talk to you guys a little bit about what those suggestions are, but we're going to, I have notes on that, but we're going to talk about it towards the end, kind of, because I feel like it just fits in, in this lesson a little bit more at the end, but it's kind of interesting some of the things that people are doing for their companies now. So, so again, uh, just reiterating surveys, meetings, one-on-one, -on -one, talking to your staff, blind surveys, public surveys, all of that good stuff. I jumped ahead from my slides. Anybody that's been in my seminar before knows that I do it all the time. Um, it just happens. All right, so now we have to outline our culture, right? So we've gotten this feedback and um, we've talked to our employees, we've talked to our um, leadership. And now it's time to like, to, to really like outline what we're gonna do and where we're gonna go with it. And this is a this is a step that I think is really important because you you're now looking at it. You're looking at it in a big picture. And when I say outline it, I don't want you guys thinking about it in your mind. I really want you to outline it um, because looking at it in weight makes you understand how to parse out what you can do and what you want to do. Because when we start talking about ways to implement what your um, staff is needing, you guys need to identify how to make that actually work. So if your staff comes to you and says, mental health awareness is really important to me, that is a super broad picture. And you guys, we have to look at it and be able to really define how that looks and come up with ideas. So categorizing it and outlining it is, is gonna be really important at this step. So this is just an example. This isn't like what the world thinks. Please don't use these examples just as straight guidance for your company. This is just an example from a company that I was researching and looking at when they were getting feedback. It was a very high pressure, high tech job. And their staff was saying 80% of their staff, and of course, if you look at my little charts, they're not 80, 30, or 50 either. It's just an infographic, so don't, don't come at me. Um, but when you, when you chart it and you're looking at outlining it and you see, okay, 80% of, of my staff is saying mental health support, but that's all they're saying. They're saying they want some help with mental health. What does that look like? Is it really mental health? And then you can dig into that outline a little bit deeper and really make sure that you aren't just assuming what they meant by that because your very first um, connection with your employees is gonna be sort of vague. And now it's time to go in deeper and maybe you're giving them suggestions. Is this what you mean? And when you're giving them those suggestions, you wanna make sure that they are um, feasible for your company and that they make sense. So. It could be as little, like for mental health support, it could be as little as, um, here are some podcasts that we're gonna send out in newsletters that are great for you to manage your day, or, hey, we're gonna give you an hour a day to listen to these mental health podcasts paid, 
paid time um, as a bonus, not just giving the resources, but it really depends on your company. So if it's a part-time employee, you may not have that time to, to um, give them, but you want them to have the resources. So you're compiling it for them and handing it to them. And if someone is parsing through that and saying, okay, this podcast is really hitting home to us in the game industry about mental health and the anxiety of this, or it's just a good a good flow for us, then it may be a resource you send out, but you'd want to uh, validate it and, and, and watch that seminar uh, the same, right? Um, so um, if it's flexible time, okay, what does that mean when they say flexible time? Everybody has a different opinion. So if you got these surveys back that said flexible time sounds good, by writing down this outline, you're going to go back in and you're going to say, okay, how does that look to you? And they're like, well, our hours are eight to five, but why are they eight to five? And then you as a company assess that. Yeah, why are they eight to five, right? We have, we're an East Coast company, but we service people all the way on the, on the West Coast. So letting uh, our staff have a full eight hours of work a day, but um, parsing it out so that they could put four hours here and four hours there where they want to might be beneficial for you instead of instead of your employee feeling like they have to answer those questions from the West Coast person from the East Coast or vice versa, at times that don't work for them by offering them that flexible time. And then in this outline, you're writing down how is it manageable? Does it work? Then hybrid models. Some people are still very, very concerned as they should be about coronavirus. Are, and, and a lot of the workforce is trying to get everybody back in uh, because they feel like they're being more productive, but are they less productive um, in your mind or are they less productive because you can't watch them? So if they like the hybrid model and we've all been home for a year, how do we make that work with remote workers? So again, these are just examples and showing you how you look at balancing what you've gotten from your survey and putting it then into an outline where you can just really look at it. And I don't care if that's post-it notes on a wall or if it's you know, color-coded charts. It doesn't matter, whatever works for you. But in this outline, that culture of well-being, make sure that you're visualizing it as well as, uh, men you know, mentali mentalizing is not a word, it, uh, having a mental checklist of it, right? So that's the biggest takeaway from this. And I'm gonna stick this over here too because this has more of my notes for my suggestions. Okay. All right, and the seventh step is create that strategy. So now we've taken everything in, right? We know what our staff wants. We know what our vision is. We know what our company is all about. We are, are basically, we've outlined everything. All right, great. Now, how, what's our strategy gonna look like? What are we gonna do with this? Um, now it's putting, you know, rubber to the road as they, so they speak. Um, one of the things that we need to do is we need to make sure that a well-defined strategy for this culture of well-being has actionable, measurable steps, okay? So everything like we were talking about when you get that information is um, subjective interpretation. So identifying what these steps really are and making them concrete, well-defined, and reliable, that is huge. You have to do this because if you have a vision of what you're going to do, but it's not really defined well to your staff or your company or your, you know, customers, how, however far that culture is going to span, then you put in all this work, but it's going to fall flat. So they need to be actionable, uh, definitely concrete. Once you commit to it, it has to follow through. And you have to follow through until you get to the resource part or that review part. And this is the part where I've been reading most people have failed because they write, they write them down and they just start them and they're like, well, nobody's going to them. And they just quit them. But we're going to talk about implementing them and measuring the success. And um, step one of making sure it works is making sure that they're concrete. Now we need metrics. This is a second set of metrics. Uh, you guys are gonna be surveyed out and metriced out, but you need metrics to base yourself on this strategy. Like, are we gonna do surveys to see if people are participating in what they think of the product or the 
programs. Um, what is our enrollment? Identifying the enrollment and the usage. If it's low, instead of just throwing that item away, you have to go back and look at that vi that um, vision and that outline and the talking to your, your, your staff and your team. Why aren't people using it? Do they not know about it? Do they, was it not really what they had in mind? Did we misinterpret? And then in the, in the next processes, we'll, we'll change them up and switch them accordingly. And just check-ins, like they don't have to be check-ins like, I saw you didn't come to the meeting, whatever the meeting was or whatever the event was. Those aren't check-ins. Check-ins are just a casual conversation with your staff and um, talking about uh, about the program and what you learned from it and not shaming them or guilting them, uh, just talking about how it worked for you and having other staff members bringing it up and say, hey, what did you think about this, da, 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 and leaving that for an open conversation with, I didn't really like that podcast. I didn't get much out of it, right? Um, as a GRD board member, I got really used to people giving us feedback about um, our seminars and we would say, well, I've done that before. But then we have to go and evaluate and say, well, they didn't see it. Did we not promote it well enough? Did we not do these things well enough? Your check-in process also cues you in that they either don't like it, they didn't see it, all the various things. So keep that in mind. And then the review process, what are our parameters to measure the, the progress of this? Is it working? Are we seeing more uh, retention with our staff? This is a long-term overview. This can't be done overnight. This can't be done in a couple of weeks. This is a long term review process. And then you need to set up when you're doing this, when you're creating your strategy, you have to decide what you think is important when to collect those metrics. The thing about it is, is you might think every month is good, but then as you start reviewing it, you may say, you know what, three months might be better adjusting that accordingly, but when you're really creating the stat strategy, you have to determine when you're gonna collect the metrics. And you need to update it regularly. Updating it regularly doesn't mean switch, change, whatever. It means either add a little bit more to keep it fresh, rotate things out, but have that in the plan. Don't just willy-nilly it, never take away anything or put things in that you think aren't working without identifying those metrics. Because we wanna make sure that we're identifying those metrics and then um, uh, reacting accordingly, which sometimes as we all know in the game industry, everything changes very, very quickly. So we're used to pivoting. Go ahead and insert my Ross, my best Ross. Rabbit! Couldn't help myself. Um, but you you definitely have to pivot. If you don't pivot, you're, you're, you're running flat. But when you're talking about your strategy for a, 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 you know, a culture of well-being, I don't want you to pivot too quickly. I don't want you to um, to think it's not working without doing the research and, and, and making sure that you did all these steps prior to before changing it. I mean, some things are just gonna bomb and you're gonna be like, ugh, that didn't go well or we never want that person back again. That's fine, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if you, everybody's telling you that they want mental health lunch and learns and you're doing them but people aren't coming to them right away, Assess your own strategy before you just remove something that somebody could have benefited from is the point there. All right, now it's time to implement the ideas. So we've outlined it, we've identified it, we've communicated with everybody. Um, we've really honed in uh, in, a, in a holistic way what we're gonna do to really strengthen our company culture. How are we gonna implement it? This, like it says, this is your action plan. This is what we're talking about when it comes to um, making sure your staff knows things. Um, how are you going to do that? You can have town hall meetings. You can send it out in newsletters. One of the things I want you to remember is just like our customers. How many times have I talked to publishers, distributors, other retailers? There's so much noise out there. Remember, there could be that much noise in your own company and people also receive information differently. I am a visual person, so if I see something, it sticks with me. Some people are audible, so if they hear it, it sticks with them. The same with marketing. If you're not marketing in various components for your business, 
social media, print, whatever you want to do, Amazon, Kickstarters, all the different ways, third party, doubling down on retail as an extension of your, you are trying all these different ways to make sure you're hitting this customer base. Why aren't you doing it with your own staff, right? So make sure that you're doing it in various different ways. So um, I think I have a slide for this. Yes. Okay. So Social media, if you have staff groups or you're on Slack or you have a Discord or what, however you IM, put notices up in there. And I don't necessarily mean a lot of times <laughs> we tend to look at our businesses as I've noticed a lot of a lot of us will look at our business like um, a working Asana or Monday or some kind of project management over overall prop program. And so we'll pin something at the top of Slack or we'll pin something at the top that's like staff announcements. Now you're trying to create a culture of well-being and you've just given them a job to look for things that are important to creating a culture of well-being. Make it easy for them. Yeah, sure. Sometimes it's harder for leadership, um, but it makes it more real. I chose for myself, we would put it in, in the various groups and just like randomly say in our IMs, this is happening this weekend and pin it. Um, you, could, you could have a place for announcements, that's fine. But if you notice that it's not getting looked at, you might need to alter that a little bit. Um, newsletters, if, you're, if your team doesn't have a newsletter, a lot of us are too small to have a newsletter. Um, you could make it a PR announcement for what you're doing for your staff. Um, because a lot of times like retailers, your, your customers love, know what, love to know what's going on with your staff. So you could just make it sort of a press release to help them know that you're going to have this big event and it was inspired for your staff and we're doing it for the staff, but maybe customers are welcome, what have you. Talk to them, posters in your, in your break areas. Um, little flyers that you just pass around like mail at everybody's desk um, or give to them so that they can take out home. Uh, if you're trying to reduce uh, paper, um, maybe you do um, something that you can text to everybody. So it texts everybody. We have so much SMS technology these days, um, but talking to the staff, right? Like letting them know that it's available. Um, but not making them feel guilty if they can't come. One of the biggest things that I learned um, in the seminar, which I'm going to share with you, is that there was a big push about five, 10 years ago about taking people outside the environment and really doing stuff with our staff. So like we would do staff outings, go places and do things. Keep in mind, some of your staff may be homebodies and they feel like they have to do those things and feel like if they don't do them, they might be missing out. So how you present it through talking to them might be um, a better option for you, but you'll get to know your staff and you'll understand what are the best ways, but you have to keep doing these in a various of ways because if you don't, they're not going to, um, they're not gonna know that they exist and then what good is the program? And this is that last step that we talked about and it's measuring your success. And when we measure our success, um, we go back to what we did to gather the success. We do surveys. We also measure metrics, how many people attended. Um, and then you wanna write down why. Why do you think they didn't attend? Maybe they didn't know about it. Maybe it wasn't intriguing enough. Maybe it's not being utilized. Or if you created a whole section of your office to be like a game room and nobody's gaming in it, maybe you don't have gamers, right? Which would be weird in the game industry. But if we're talking broad scope, like, um, uh, like a tech company, maybe they're not gaming, right? Maybe they're not gamers. Um, so having something else available, maybe it gets switched out after a year of trying to a workout room. There are a lot of companies um, that have little small gyms for their employees and little areas for you to be a little bit more physical. Um, maybe your staff want a place where there's a treadmill with a repositionable desk. So sometime during the day, they can get on the treadmill and work while they're being physical because we know now that those things work. So if your little thing, your things that you have added to make your culture 
better aren't being utilized, identify that. We have to identify what we're doing with, with those, those elements. So measure, evaluate, and restructure, and you go back to the beginning of the program again each time. It's basically like making a SWOT analysis for your company and also measuring, do you think productivity is higher? Do you think retention has been retained? These are long-term um, factors that you wanna measure. I've been looking for like a, a, a a fun like template that kind of helps us measure the, the success with a checklist. If I don't find one that I think is um, really good by the time I present this again um, live, then maybe um, then maybe I'll just create one myself. But but using these nine steps as your checklist is really the most important part of of that um, measurement tool. So identify what's working, identify if you've gotten the word out, take accountability if you don't think that you have. Um, that whole philosophy, if you build it, they will come, eh, might not work when we're in a noisy environment and also might be we built the wrong thing. So they're asking for mental health help, but what they really meant was they need brain breaks. They just need some physical activity to come back. They didn't want your podcast. They didn't want that. Or we gave them physical activity and they wanted the podcast. So we have to measure these and see how they're working because a lot of times we can't assume that our staff is going to be quite that um, for, for right. We hope that they are, but we still are their bosses and there's still a lot of people that still have that like um, overall worry that our um, higher ups, how they would think. So we want to manage that. We want to get to a place where they don't feel like they can't say these things to us. And they, we want to get to a place where when they say them to us, we, um, we're we happy to hear them and we're welcoming of them and we take it into account. And uh, we're, we're, I'm not saying to do everything that they need. You still have to do it within the means of your company and what's you know, feasible. You can't be doing six different things and giving up six hours of your work day to uh, your culture and not getting any work done. That's not realistic, right? But small things help us open up and help us get on board. The second thing is one of the things that was really interesting to me when I was taking some of these classes and going through some of these seminars through various different like PhDs and different things. One of the things they said to, to me was something that I've always learned when I was, um, and I'm going to go to the awesome example slide because we kind of moved on from that measuring. But one of the things that they said that stuck with me was something that I've always said. Um, you know, you in sales, I've been in sales for many, many, many years. I don't want salespeople that don't believe in what I am I am selling or I have to offer as a company. And you need to make sure that your team is on board with what you're selling as well too. And that we're open to hear why they're not. And that could be as simple as being able to say, yeah, I'm really not sure that that game is gonna sell. I just, um, I'm not sure that it's one of our A games or in, in retail, um, you know, if you have somebody that's not a gamer, we joke all the time that we can we can teach anybody about games, but we think to ourselves, everybody's going to love games because we love games. But if they don't, you're never going to have, they're never going to buy into that culture of well-being if they don't like what you're about. So also remembering to keep people, um, uh, have a steady hand with people, or like a, a steady flow of people that believe in what you're doing at the crux, right? You can't, I've always hated that saying, um, they were like, Dawn, you're so good at sales. You, you could sell snow to an Eskimo. And I always thought, is that a compliment? Because that sort of sounds like I'm, um, like I'm selling people something they don't need. And um, we do have to sell things sometimes that people don't need. But if we feel so strongly about it, we probably shouldn't be selling it. Um, and so making sure that people fall in line with your corporate values is really important too. That happens 
through high, great hiring practices, not being offensive. Um, and, and I'm definitely not asking you to break HR rules, um, but making sure that people are really on board with what you do and have a passion for it, but still have the skills. In our industry, we often think that it's one or the other. It's not, it's not, it's just not. You can have both. Um, and, and breaking down that, um, uh, taking this to the next level, creating this culture within even our industry, right? Like having that common respect for all three of our tiers, which at Gamma, clearly we are, we are moving towards that with our new bylaws, but um, making sure that everything that you do is ingrained um, in what you would want for your company outside as well. So yeah, I digress. Um, but Let's talk about some awesome examples, because I think that that's really important in this kind of um, uh, talk. And I kind of want to hear about some of the things that you've had in the past as well that were examples and that you guys thought were uh, really good and you appreciated from your employers and things that you do. Um, and I want to talk about some awesome examples I heard about recently. We've got... Um, Gigabytes, um, I'm featuring them on the FLGS spotlight. So I've been talking to uh, David Finn quite a bit. And um, he hired a fitness truck to come out in front of his store. So his staff didn't have to go anywhere special. They could come in a little bit early. The truck came and the guy did fitness in their, in their front yard. And basically, so for COVID, you know, you're spread out and you're working out. Now, granted, he's in Georgia, so they could do that in the winter, but he was being smart and thinking about what does my staff need? They've been shut down from um, their, their gyms. Here's something I can do for my staff. And quite honestly, he might've been doing it before COVID. I'm, I, I guess I didn't really ask him. Um, but that's just something that has nothing to do with gaming, but he knows that um, if they feel better, they'll, you know, and he, he paid for it. They don't pay for anything. He just brings it. And it's just something he does for his staff. Had a lot of people um, that uh, take their staff on trips. They have parties. They have gatherings. They do movies. They do all these various things. Remember, those are great things. They're also outside of your work day. So when we're talking about this uh, culture of well-being, we, um, we've got to remember that it needs to encompass the whole work day right? A lot of us work on the computer all day long, not in retail, but in the publishing side of things, we're talking via Zoom, we're having meetings, we're doing all these things. Um, that can get really taxing. So what are we doing for our employees outside of that? Some really great examples I saw, like we talked about before, was walking meetings. Now, when I think about walking meetings, I kind of laugh. I go back to when I was on the board of directors for Gamma. And um, if you all have seen Stefan, he's like a foot and a half taller than me and his legs are about the height of me. And so we were walking to a restaurant and we were talking about all the exciting things we all wanted to do. It was a whole board. And this was back when Rick Loomis was um, still with us and he was struggling. So I called, um, because Stefan wasn't meaning to be fast, right? He just is, he's got big legs. So I called us an Uber and we rode together and they kept walking and everybody in that team was getting what they needed out of it. I have short little insteps, so I wasn't keeping up very well. Um, and I used to say to the GRD, walk slower, small instep. Um, so just keeping those little things in mind. And Stefan was like, I'm so sorry, I'll slow down. And I was like, you don't need to slow down. We're getting an Uber, it's cold. And then we just continued and left and everybody was feeling good because everybody was getting what they needed and taken care of. Stefan's walking fast because it was cold and he wanted to get to the warmth. I couldn't walk fast and Rick couldn't walk fast. So we took an Uber. Uber. It was just a moment of identifying what everybody needed and everybody being accepting of what everybody needed and being okay with it. And that's what we have to bring into our businesses, right? So what does my business look like? Well, I sell fun. Is my staff having fun? Is my staff feeling fun? Are they healthy? Are they happy? Are they well taken care of? What are their passions? Am I nurturing it? Um, if there's talking about mental health, you could do extra days off for PTO. No questions asked. A lot of people are asking for you get, you know, adding five days of no questions asked, just PTO 
days. And companies come back and say, we're going to give you more free PTO days, but we might have a moratorium on them during these days because, you know, it's a busy time or whatever. Um, so it's give and take, right? Um, flexible schedules are some good examples. Um, Client-specific well-being seminars. So we do a lot in creativity. So we might want to have um, enroll our staff in a seminar about how how to get past that 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 foggy I'm not feeling creative moments. That's really great ways to empower your staff. Um, Client-specific. Um, I mean, financial wellness programs. So you don't have to offer more money, but you might hire somebody to come in and talk to your staff about, you know, we are retail workers. And a lot of times as retail workers, we don't think about putting back because it's so paycheck to paycheck. Here are some things that you can do in a smaller, um, uh, a, a lower level pay rate to help you be successful for the future because I do care about you. Um, hopefully we're all giving living wages, but beyond that, there's still a difference between entry level and C-suite, right? So helping each level within that level. Um, and that doesn't mean going and paying them a C-suite salary for entry level work. That just, it doesn't, it, that doesn't make sense. That's not what we're asking people to do when we're asking them to create a culture of well-being. And I have to joke and tell you as a Gen Xer, I always used to say, you know, what do you mean uh, a culture of well-being? <laughs> um, go to work, get paid, blah, 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 blah. And then as I started taking these seminars, I laughed at myself because as a Gen Xer, I was already doing these things. I, with my staff at the store, we knew that Saturdays were just nonstop. And my staff also wanted to get paid the whole time, but I also wanted them to be healthy and happy and not burn out. So we would carry in food or order in food. We had a snack cabinet with candy and um, bananas and healthy food, whatever they needed. We just rotated it out. It was easy for me to do because my, um, my staff was comprised of some of my family and not family. So I felt like I was feeding my family and my staff family all at the same time. And sometimes our staff members would say, um, oh, I want to carry in something. It has to be what you guys are comfortable with. I know there's people out there like, oh, I would never carry in. That's such a liability. That could be do it within your own parameters. You know, I'm giving examples. I'm not saying, um, obviously check with all laws and whatever local things. Um, but do things that feel good for each other. That's the crux of it all. The second thing that I noticed in these seminars was the old adage of, and most of us retailers really do this. I don't do anything in my store that I wouldn't, I, I do everything I ask my employees to do. Now, sometimes I have an employee that's better at something, so I don't want to do it because she's really good at merchandising, for example, so I'm going to let Dawn merchandise. Um, but Katie's really good at graphic design and Zachary's really good at assembling these, you know, um, pop-up displays. There are elements that, yes, a lot of times somebody is good at it and you let them do that. But making sure that we as the top staff do what our employees do and always be there to help them is sometimes just the very basis groundwork for that uh, culture of well-being. Um, doing stuff outside of your company for your community, huge. Um, some people in your company aren't going to care about it. They don't care if you do stuff that's philanthropic or for your community base, but some people do. So again, going back to identifying them, and this is just examples of things you can do. Um, we talked about hybrid work models, um, social justice, wellness challenges. I don't really, I didn't read in about that too much. So I don't, I don't know what they were uh, talking about in that example specifically. So I can learn more. Uh, no meeting Fridays. So this is interesting. I saw a lot of people saying, oh, my company just has meetings to meet. And I can relate to that because, you know, I'm a collaborative thinker, but some people aren't collaborative thinkers. So they may just feel you're having needless meetings. But yet for me, it's beneficial because I'm getting information. Maybe you have a day that there's no meetings. It's just heads down, get work done. Or maybe it's all meetings, get all your meetings, just whatever you guys decide. Again, these are just examples. Um, 
flex schedules, paid time off for mental health days we talked about, company paid healthy lunches once a month. Um, like I said, we we did every weekend, a weekday. We also snacked, a, a, we also um, stocked a snack cabinet. And I've heard a lot of people say, well, I don't want to do that. I don't think I could afford to keep up with it. I think there's a, a written um, thing where people don't usually take advantage of those things. And if you have one person taking advantage of it, maybe they need it, right? Try to not think about the worst and think about what that's telling you about your staff member. What, what might you need to, to know? Is there something going on? Is it a teenager that works for you that their parents are struggling and they're both without jobs? This gives you ideas to also help and support your own work community because a lot of times people are too proud to talk about those things. Um, we talked about walking meetings. We've talked about um, incorporating well-being topics in town halls, like when you guys are um, you know, having like touch bases or staff meetings, just kind of talking about um, things. A lot of people are adding 15 minutes at the beginning of their meetings to kind of like chit chat with each other. It can be hard on Zoom because, you know, if right now we're um, away from each other, but those are ideas as well. Um, breaks for physical fitness, media, um, meditation or other wellness activities. Again, don't always think of physical fitness. Think of, um, you know, we do quiet rooms at Gen Con and Origins and trade days and have a quiet room, have a non, somebody just needs to go away. And one of the most interesting things I saw was somebody had um, in Chicago, there was a company that has a very stressful um, financial company where they're working with um, families um, like probate and stuff like that. Very stressful, high stress. They added a smash room, which I thought was hilarious. And their employees were just going on and on and on about how beneficial it was. Because instead of complaining about it for hours and hours, they would go and smash something and then come back and feel better. Okay, again, check with your laws and safety regulations and all that good stuff, but I thought it was hilarious. So, so those are some of the examples. And um, uh, we're going to kind of go into a section where we can kind of brainstorm as a group, but I'm going to stop the seminar for that portion. Um, so for the seminar portion, thanks for being with us. We will have more of these sort of seminars where we learn stuff and bring it to you through Gamma's education program. Um, again, not based on any of my beliefs. I mean, I put some editorial in there, but the premise of how to do things are based um, on um, well working skills. So thank you guys for being here. We're going to go into our network portion of it if you want to stick around.